Today's lecture continues our series on the cranial nerves with cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve. Now, the facial nerve begins at the pontomedullary junction, slightly uh, lateral to the sixth cranial nerve, and continues anteriorly and passes inside of the internal acoustic meatus. Now from there it gets a bit complex. As you can see from the type of fibers, it has special sensory, general sensory, parasympathetic motor, as well as branchiomotor fibers. And we will go through all of these on another diagram. There are multiple functions which will be discussed later, and the result of the lesions will result in Bell's palsy, loss of taste, hyperacusis, and decreased glandular production. Now, looking at this next diagram, we can see that the facial nerve does get very complex, but we'll go through it one step at a time. So we see that the facial nerve emerges from the internal acoustic meatus, and then it forms a ganglion, or a collection of cell bodies here, and this is called the geniculate ganglion. Geniculate means knee, as you can see, this um, Fibers make a 90 degree turn and head inferiorly from here, hence the name geniculate ganglion. Now the facial nerve fibers continue south to the styloid-mastoid foramen, but before reaching that foramen, it gives off three branches, one to the greater petrosal nerve, one to the stapedius muscle, and one to the corda tympani. Now the greater petrosal nerve pierces through the facial canal, and I have um, demarcated the greater petrosal nerve in a dotted fashion to show that it has parasympathetic fibers. So, it comes out of the facial canal, continues and makes its route through the foramen cecum, through the pterygoid canal, where it reaches the pterygopalatine ganglion, another collection of cells, and continues on passing through the maxillary and lacrimal nerves of another nerve and finally innervates parasympathetic fibers to the lacrimal gland. Now, the stapedius muscle um, is a muscle that is attached to the stapedius bone and it helps to dampen sound in our inner ear. If we hear a loud noise, this muscle works to dampen or soften that sound. And then here we have the corda tympani. Again, it is dotted showing parasympathetic fibers. Now, this uh, nerve follows along and then hitches a ride along with the lingual nerve and continues on to supply taste to the anterior two thirds of the tongue as well as passing into the submandibular ganglion where there it continues to innervate the sublingual and submandibular glands for secretion. Now, once the facial nerve has exited through the stylomastoid foramen, it immediately branches out into a great number of branches. These branches include the temporal, the zygomatic, the buccal, the mandibular, the cervical, the posterior belly of the digastric muscle, as well as the styloid hyoid muscle, and these both function to elevate the hyoid bone, and the auricular branch. Aside from these two, the rest of these branches are to either innervate skin or the muscles of facial expression, namely zygomatic, temporal, buccal, mandibular, and cervical. And I have use this black outline to show that these branched nerves here pass through the parotid gland but do not innervate the parotid gland. They merely pass through branch and just use it as a means to exit through the other areas of the face. Now, on the right here, we have described all of the different functions, which most of them I've already gone through. So in the branchiomotor uh, fibers, we have the muscles of facial expression being 
innervated, and these include the temporal, zygomatic, buxal, mandibular, and cervical nerves, the posterior belly of the digastric, and the styloid muscles are innervated by branchiomotor fibers. Our special sensory fibers innervate the taste of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, here from the corda tympani. We have general sensory, which innervates the skin of the auricle, or the ear, and the skin behind the ear. This comes from the auricular branch back here. And we have parasympathetic fibers going to the lacrimal gland from the greater petrosal nerve, submandibular gland, sublingual gland, again here from the corda tympani, as well as mucous membranes of the nasopharynx and palate, which is included down here. Returning to this diagram, we'll go over the results of lesions of the facial nerve. Some of the lesions that can occur is Bell's palsy. Now, Bell's palsy is typically uh, um, associated with half facial paralysis or hemiparalysis of the face. And essentially, to test for this, you can ask a patient to raise their eyebrows, raise their frontalis muscle or their forehead muscles, as well as smile. And what you would see is that there would be a drooping of the uh, face. It would not retract in the smile. An eyeball on the affected side would tend to tilt up or have an upward gaze. The forehead would not wrinkle when raising the eyebrow, and even the nasal wing or ala of the nose would tend to be flatter. This is due to the fact that if you have a, a lesion of the facial nerve, there's a possibility that the muscles of facial expression could be affected, which would cause the Bell's palsy. There could be a loss of taste sensation due to a lesion in the corda tympani. Now, all of the taste would not be lost, seeing as other cranial nerves innervate the posterior aspect of taste in the tongue, but the anterior two-thirds of the tongue would lose its taste. There could be a hyperacusis in a lesion of the facial nerve. This would be due to the fact that the stapedius muscle would be injured and there would not be a dampening of sound if there are loud noises. So the hyperacusis means that you would be sensitive to loud sounds. And there would be a decrease in gland production and secretion due to the fact that the submandibular, the sublingual, as well as the lacrimal and mucous glands are innervated by the facial nerve, so there would be a decrease in gland production and could result in dry eyes and dry mouth. And this is cranial nerve number seven.